Joining us by phone, Professor Robin D.G. Kelly, Professor of American History at UCLA. Professor, welcome back to the program. I'm here with Emma Viglund. Yes, thanks. It's all great to, to talk to you, and apologies for the technical problem. Uh, no worries. That's It's probably on our end. So let's, um, you know, I was, I was just saying beforehand, I was debating as to uh, whether we should come into work for today on Juneteenth. And it is a it's a new holiday, uh, I guess, officially made a federal holiday last year. There's there's many states, I think, still where you don't get the day off um, and, right. you know, wanted to wanted to educate people about it. And um, well, let if you could just give us the sort of the I, I mean, uh, you know, I guess the in a nutshell, uh, Juneteenth, uh, what it celebrates and then want to talk about sort of the the broader implications of it, and then, and then also how it may, might relate to your work, which has been, uh, and we've interviewed uh, you for the, the story mm -hmm. of, of, um, of Alabama and uh, communists, uh, black Alabama and communists trying to organize in, um, uh, during the Depression era. Um, right. and, and these ideas of, of how racism is so intricate to capitalism. But before we get there, let's start with just the remedial Juneteenth. What what is it? Right, exactly. So let's let's let me just confirm that this is an important day of work. Um, it's not supposed to be a day of just relaxation, because in many ways Juneteenth is uh, declared a certain kind of Freedom Day. So let's let's give the background. Um, you know, the general story is that you know in the state of Texas. <laughs> Um, African Americans allegedly were unaware that um, the Civil War was over and that uh, Lincoln had issued the, the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. This is not exactly true, by the way, but this is a part of the myth. And so basically on June 19, 1865, after the Union forces had occupied Galveston, Texas, in, you know, invaded and basically declared uh, the war over, defeating um, the Confederacy there in the state of Texas. That's when um, General uh, Major General Granger read this proclamation that um, after that, that slavery was over. That again, I, I say this a myth because Galveston was one of the major uh, international port cities, had a, a, a significant working class. Uh, including a European working class, very much aware of what was happening around the globe. So it's not that people didn't know. Um, it was that the Union forces weren't able to occupy Texas until that time. Uh, to go back to what it really represents, yes, it does represent in many ways what Black Texans think of as the moment of emancipation. But what it was initially called was Jubilee Day. It wasn't called Juneteenth. Uh, and it was a reference to... Um, Leviticus, uh, chapter 25 of the Bible, which promised, you know, in, in terms of Jubilee, it promised restitution of the land, that is that the land shall revert to the original owner. It promises cancellation of all debts. It promised um, in Jubilee the freeing of all, uh, freeing of all slaves and bond servants, right? Uh, so the, the presumption is that this, this biblical moment is a moment when all slaves are freed. Uh, and it's a, an expression of divine sovereignty. That is, that the true owners of the land, uh, the land is, 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 is God's land, right? So these celebrations were deeply religious, but deeply political. They, were, they held parades, picnics, performances, and these political gatherings were moments to talk about the right to vote for black people, the right to land, um, the right to some kind of reparations. Um, the, the, the need to create political institutions uh, for leadership. And that's what Ju uh, Juneteenth came to represent. Um, and it was the promise of reconstruction, which we know was overthrown uh, and collapsed under the weight of, of Jim Crow. And in the 1930s, the Juneteenth celebrations came back you know, with a force. Um, and it was tied to working class movements, in fact. Um, in the 30s, uh, as black people migrated out from Texas to places like California, 
uh, and throughout the, the, the Midwest and, and West Coast, they brought Juneteenth with them. Uh, Juneteenth is maybe a federal holiday, but it's not a new holiday for black communities around the country, especially on the West Coast. It's not an accident like the Poor People's Campaign uh, in 68 held a Juneteenth solidarity rally uh, in Washington, D.C., you know, in, for the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, the Black Radical Congress, which I attended in 1998, we, we held the founding meeting on Juneteenth. So Juneteenth represents, you know, a day of struggle, a day of resistance, a recognition that the freedoms promised in the 13th Amendment, freedoms promised in the so-called Emancipation Proclamation uh, were just unfulfilled and was just a promise of liberation, not not real freedom. You know, that the the and i don't think i was aware and we've i I think we've probably done uh now this is the fourth or fifth year in a row that we've had someone on to talk about uh juneteenth and i don't know that i knew that it was called jubilee because i ran into this situation with my kid actually Mm. uh my nine-year-old explaining um explaining juneteenth as just sort of, I guess, the, the straightforward, uh, this is when in Texas they were the last people to hear that the, the, the chattel slaves were freed. And, uh, and he, it was his reaction of like, yeah, that was a good thing, and now it, that's over, where it sort of like feels like, well, actually, nah, I mean, it's a little <laughs> more complicated than that. And it, it did occur to me, and I don't want to be, you know, uh, I mean, th- this is maybe a little bit cynical, but this is, when I contemplate our holidays, like Independence Day, well, that was a one-time event, and it and it fundamentally shifted the dynamic of, you know, uh, what America was. But like the Memorial Days, you know, we don't really spend, I think, the time that we should contemplating these things. Mm-hmm. But at least there's an opportunity to do that on some level. Right. Like celebrating the end of chattel slavery, sort of feels like it sort of like tries to put things in a box and sort of, I don't know, say, well, we finished right. that and that's that. Right. right. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. It, it puts it in a box as if somehow it's past, but it does something else too. And that is that the, the narrative and even, even coming from, from decent liberals and some leftists, um, the narrative is skewed because it does two things that are really uh, problematic. One, it presents the Emancipation Proclamation as the thing that ended slavery. When we know that it was just a wartime document, basically, that did not apply to 450,000 enslaved people in Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, in Tennessee. Uh, it didn't apply uh, to places that were loyal to the Union. And not only that, but it only applied to the Confederate states, and unless the Union Army was there to emancipate people, um, they they were still enslaved. So the fact of the matter is that enslaved people freed themselves. When Union troops started to enter into uh, uh, Confederate territory and win battles, black people flocked to Union lines because they knew they could get protection there. They, They freed themselves. They undermined the Confederacy. That's a story we don't we don't tell. Then what ends up happening is that the Emancipation Proclamation becomes a great document. The Thirteenth Amendment just drops out, you know, altogether. And so that's that's part of the story. The other part of the story is, you know, when we talk about the history of Texas, Texas is tricky. Texas is the only state that started out as an independent, started out as part of Mexico, then part then became an independent republic for the purposes of keeping slaves when Mexico had abolished slavery in 1827 and then was annexed, but was annexed and became a state as a result of war when the U.S. waged war with Mexico and took Texas, California, Nevada, New Mexico, and all those other places, right? So this is the the result that Texas was one of these states designed to be uh, a a safe haven for slavery. So during the, um, the Civil War, um, after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued and some Confederate states were losing, what did the slaveholders do? They flocked to Texas. They took their enslaved people and crossed the 180,000 
enslaved people were brought into Texas. Uh, and, you, and you don't think that those people who knew and passed on information about the Emancipation Proclamation didn't know that this thing had been issued? Of course they did. They, this is why they knew they were leaving. And so that's the moment where a number of those who could escape, black people could escape, they fled south to Mexico. They you couldn't fl- flee north. There was no place to go. And when, so by the time Union troops showed up to retake Galveston, because by the way, I should mention that Galveston was occupied by Union forces uh, in 1862 for several months until January 1st, 1863, the day the Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to be implemented, they were defeated <laughs> by the Confederacy. Mm. So this myth of like people not knowing is, is, is dangerous. And it also takes away the agency from enslaved people from who were the forces that destroyed the Confederacy in the first place. What, what's your reaction to, I mean, you mentioned Texas and that's what made me think of this. Um, this Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday against the backdrop of a mass conservative movement to rewrite history in the form of these anti-critical race theory bills. Um, because, you know, I am, I'm reminded of almost the way that Reagan was the president who mm-hmm. implemented MLK day. Right. And it's, it saps it and almost, you know, uh, papers over the struggle and the meaning behind it there, there's a dichotomy there that i think is a little troubling uh because it it, yeah. it there's no real reckoning with the fact that history is being rewritten as we speak right right no that's a really good point in fact um there's one slight difference between say um a conservative reagan overseeing King's holiday versus someone who's perceived to be, right, that's the Biden-Harris administration, perceived to be liberal, pushing back against a right-wing wave. So this is what what it appears to be, and I'll tell you what it really is. So it appears to be um, that this holiday is a bulwark against, right, the the wave of anti-so-called CRT uh, history, CRT pedagogy, right? In other words, that this is the bulwark against the right-wing attack on history, when in fact, it in some ways masks that attack. And let me explain what I mean. Um, it's easy for the Biden administration, and all of its friends to say, you know, we're, we're not, we're against the criminalizing of teaching of anything considered to be quote-unquote divisive. We're against the attacks on critical race theory, which is not really critical race theory, it's just liberal multiculturalism. Um, and we can prove it because we support this holiday. Uh, and so what you're going to see is right wingers saying this holiday is, is a, a travesty. Uh, you're not allowed to teach about um, uh, Juneteenth or emancipation or any of that stuff. And so we end up uh, pre- imagining that as li- that the liberal wing is our best hope, when in fact, we've been spending years pushing back against a certain kind of liberal erasure of this history. The liberal erasure is the one that says, Lincoln freed the slaves. President Johnson gave us a civil rights bill. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, the, you know the, the, the kind of working class grassroots struggles that made these things possible are erased. But there's another side to the story, something I've been harping on, is that all these conservatives who are trying to outlaw uh, what is essentially an anti-racist curriculum, right, because they say their children will feel uncomfortable, um, are not willing at the same time to outlaw racist curriculum. That is to say, no one's talking about removing Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia or John C. Calhoun or Edmund Ruffin or all these like pro-slavery writings from libraries or from teaching, you know, that's like the other side, right? In fact, these same people who are against anti-racist history are the same ones who would argue that, you know, like the 13th and 14th Amendment, that was kind of legislative overreach. You know? yeah. 
<laughs> the same ones who say that. So we're we're in a in a uh, a real hard struggle right now, and my fear is that if we fall into the trap of saying that what we need are simply more federal holidays that could celebrate the unity of this nation rather than the history of its um, uh, problematic and racist past, uh, something that could bring us together rather than understand why, what the consequences for the defeat of Reconstruction were. You know, something that could help us really understand, you know, why is it that 10 black people get shot down in Buffalo and how that's related to Reconstruction. That's what we need to know. We don't need to sort of make the case that, uh, see, America's, uh, you know, moral arc bends towards justice. Mm. And we know that in time we're going to prevail. And that's the lesson. That's not the lesson. That, I, I mean, I have to say, and I thought, you know, part of it was just sort of, I, you know, uh, I, I have become so um, just interested in, in Reconstruction. I was like, it, maybe it would have been better to have a holiday to commemorate, you know, the, the coup in South Carolina uh, mm. during Reconstruction, essentially, you know, uh, or... Um, you know, uh, massacres. Any of the bombings and, and, of churches, yeah. of black churches. Yeah, right. I mean, just the, uh, you know, something that would bring about that history because, yes, we all know uh, chattel slavery ended. Like, okay, we get it. Um, and, but that's, that did not solve the, the fundamental problems. And, and um, so, but uh, with that said, at the very least, it, having a holiday called Juneteenth allows us to have these type of conversations and, and examine it. So it's, it's doing some of the work, uh, I guess, that we right, would right. want. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I have to say, you know, it, 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 does, it does the work. And actually, if we do it right, it can do the, to me, this is just my own take, to me, Juneteenth is an opportunity if we do it right to raise his issues in a more powerful way. My, my, my concern about commemorating these acts of violence um, is that it could possibly fall back into the same liberal trap, and that is to show the kind of history of victimization mm -hmm. and that we've been able to overcome it. But here's the strength of Juneteenth. And it's so funny because I'm supposed to be giving a, uh, a talk about it in the next couple of hours in Pasadena, right? And... Um, Juneteenth, I treat Juneteenth not as the end of slavery, but the beginnings of a new war for Reconstruction. That's how we treat. So if you think of Juneteenth as the beginnings of the fight for freedom, not the end of slavery, but the beginnings of the fight for freedom, then we have to deal with what comes next. And that is why I remind us that the original name was the Day of Jubilee. Because Jubilee wasn't about the celebration of the end of, of the nightmare of slavery. These were political meetings every year on June 19th and gatherings that said, what are we going to do to preserve our freedom? What are we going to do to turn our liberation into actual freedom? What's our next steps? And that's why Jubilee made these claims, these arguments, claims for reparations, claims to redistribute land. And that, you know, one could extend that as well to include indigenous people. Because one of the stories about Texas is that, you know, I'm sure you might know about the, the, the Salt Creek Massacre, as it was called. And this was in Texas, 1871, when um, some of the Plains Indians were, you know, again, trying to come back, get their land back. And they waged an attack, you know, against settlers. Uh, the great general, and I say this, you know, tongue-in-cheek, the great General William T. Sherman, who's known for redistributing land uh, to black people uh, in South Carolina, uh, you know, during Civil War. He's heroic in that sense, who all, also has a history as one of the most vicious, merciless um, uh, in, uh, killers of indigenous people, uh, actually used the, the so-called Salt Creek Massacre as justification to wage one of the most vicious wars on Native peoples in Texas and throughout the South. And so in many ways, the post, the, the moment of seeking freedom after 
that day of Juneteenth, the day of uh, June 19th, uh, led to this, opened up the door for this massacre by the same Reconstruction general who's heroic, uh, you know, to basically, you know, murder uh, 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 Native peoples. Um, And he had a lot of practice at it, by the way, you know, in the Seminole Wars and whatnot. But the main point here is that we can take Juneteenth as an unfulfilled promise. Juneteenth is the opportunity to talk about reparations. Juneteenth is the opportunity to talk about decolonization. It's the opportunity to talk about the violence that was meted out, that, was, that we've had inherited, including the January 6th rebellion. January 6th dates back to the failure of Reconstruction because you mentioned the coup in Wilmington, North Carolina. Well, there was a coup in um, Grimes County, Texas, uh, very similar to what happened in Wilmington, where the, a group called calling themselves the White Man's Union, as if you know you needed any clarification what they <laughs> represented, the White Man's Union, led by Democrats, literally went to the the the, the um, seat of Grimes County and killed all the elected officials who were populist, black and white, and took over the government. That's the legacy of the defeat of Reconstruction, the defeat of Jubilee, the defeat of Juneteenth, right? That's the story that we need to tell rather than just, oh, these poor black people didn't know, have a clue about what was happening. And thank goodness for the union, thank, thank goodness for the military who told them they were free. You know? That's not the narrative. Um, uh, and, and I should say that, you, I, you know, I've read uh, where you maybe I think it was last year uh, you wrote about um, sort of uh, applying those that same dynamic about uh, about Juneteenth and, and the concept of Jubilee also to the um, the t- in, on behalf of the Palestinian people as well. Mm-hmm. who are subject to their own we have a, a similar dynamic in terms of like indigenous and um and uh you know I- exploited and and dispossessed people um amongst right. the palestinians um w- let's b- just broaden this conversation just a little bit in terms of uh, of of your ideas about uh, racism and its relationship to capitalism because i think this is you know, um, it, when you talk about everything that, I guess, continues on from uh, that mm-hmm. that that day uh, from Juneteenth, um, this plays a big part. Right, definitely. Um, well, there's many ways I can enter into that. I mean, the, the if there's a lesson here that could link the question of capitalism, racism, and and Juneteenth, it's very simple that. You know, we have to understand the history of capitalism uh, in its current iteration as being um, rooted in in the very systems of oppression that preceded capitalism, which includes racism and includes patriarchy, gender oppression. Uh, and so, in many ways, when we think about, for example, um, the I mean. Just some obvious examples for right now, the, the commercialization of Juneteenth, the Juneteenth sales and things like that. <laughs> That's the most crass example of the way in which uh, black suffering and exploitation and extraction uh, becomes uh, once again repackaged, recommodified so, so people could either buy themselves a little bit of um, uh, uh you know, peace of mind to say that, you know, I've contributed something to uh, the people whose, whose, um, whose wealth I was able to exploit. exploit. Um, Or, you know, there's also the question of, of the current struggle for reparations and understanding what were the systems that led to this massive wealth extraction. Slavery is an obvious one. You know, you have unrequited labor uh, that created wealth for um, and when I say wealth, I mean wealth not not just for like I'm not talking about the working class of poor white people. I'm talking about uh, from railroad companies to big agriculture uh, to shipping to insurance. I mean that's where the wealth accumulated. But then you move into the area, the period of Jim Crow, 
and how housing policies and segregation also led to transfer of wealth. Um, a study done in, in California, uh, 2014, showed that in just an LA metropolitan area right now, the wealth gap is, you know, in terms of, of wealth, uh, African Americans have like $200 worth of wealth, median wealth, uh, versus whites have $110,000. That's not all slavery. Some of it's about the fact that if you live in certain neighborhoods, the value of your property goes up. That value goes up because um, of federal and state policies that determine value in the real estate industry, determine value based on race. That's an old practice and still happening today. So people are losing money um, all the time, and that money is being transferred, let alone the, the use of regressive taxation, which goes on to this day, where you got poor people, many of whom are black and brown, who pay sales taxes and pay all these kinds of taxes, whereas tax breaks are happening with corporate America and with property owners in many ways. Um, and so the kind of, and then at the same time, those same communities that pay this regressive tax uh, are not getting the benefits of their tax money. They're, they're dealing with defunded, defunded schools, right. uh, the lack of you know, uh, services in the communities. And, and this whole range of things that are going on. And that's just examples from today, uh, let alone the historical examples we could talk about. Well, you know, the, um, one of the, the arguments that you, uh, that you make, broadly speaking, uh, you know, to generalize, of course, you know, sort of mm-hmm. uh, across your writing, is, is that for, for capitalism to exist, you need to have a um, a, uh, a a a a some type of like uh, I guess structure of thinking where you can exploit, which is inherent to capitalism. You can exploit other people um, if they are not quite people in the way that you're a person. Like if they're mm-hmm. somehow less. Um, th- like that dynamic, because I- I'm sort of fascinated by this because on some level, like that's also how feudalism worked too. Right. I mean, y- mm-hmm. y- you know, and, and I would imagine, I'm not even sure what we, we call, you know, the period of, of late antiquity or, uh, you know, uh, early history when we're talking about Philistines and, um, and, you know, uh, th- that era, but uh, presumably, um, uh, for, you know, in the context of, of indigenous uh, folk in, in this country, you know, sometimes the, uh, the way that they refer to themselves as people and uh, other, other uh, groups are not people. Like that dynamic is, seems to have always been the case with humanity of othering people from whom you want to take things. Uh, and the othering right. has to start. But capitalism is just like is is a continuance of that. How, it, it, explain that and also how it how capitalism sort of reproduces that racism and that that in this in our instance white privilege or you know uh, Eddie Gloud calls it the value gap. Uh, there's a lot of different mm-hmm. sort of terms for it. Um, how does capitalism reproduce that? so as to maintain this dynamic where you can justify exploiting other people. Right, right. No, no, that's a good point. And this is, this is the lesson I learned from my late teacher, um, Cedric Robinson, who wrote about, he, he wasn't the first one to introduce the, the co- concept of racial capitalism, but he emphasized in his book, Black Marxism, published back in 1983, that... Um, that it's exactly what you said, that, that capitalism emerges within a particular civilization uh, that is in Europe in which difference was used for, for millennia to justify uh, or to structure, I should say, you know, um, the value of people, um, their ability, their place in, in the world and their place in, in production. So, for example, you know, um, you mentioned feudalism. I mean, you know, anti-Semitism, for example, is another way in which, you know, um, whole groups of people get placed within a particular hierarchy. 
So basically what this means is that capitalism emerges within a regime that's already racial and already gendered. This is not to say that, that the, the concepts of race don't change, because they do change. And in fact, the 18th century becomes scientific racism. And in certain groups of people who are considered divided, like, you know, the, the Irish were considered lower orders than the, the English, they begin to consolidate in this category called whiteness, you know. And um, Irishness doesn't disappear, but it, it's, its devaluation disappears over time. Um, and so, so these, these systems of difference are always dynamic. And of course, there's a gendered regime in which women's labor or anyone identified as woman uh, or feminized end up being devalued as well, which allows for increased extraction of value. So when you talk about, uh, when you ask the question about how does it continue, you know, one of the big tragedies of racial, the system of racial capitalism is the way that it captures a segment of the white working class, you know, and actually it ties its identity uh, to race, that is whiteness, into masculinity, that is manliness. And so what ends up happening is that too many white working people see their value in whiteness and and therefore see themselves as different from different from anyone who's not them who's not white and you know this is great um quote by Serge robinson where he says you know white patrimony deceives some of the majority of americans right patriotism and nationalism others but then he says the more future reality was the theft they themselves endured in the voracious exploration of others they facilitated. In the scrap, which was their reward, was the installation of black inferiority into their shared national culture. It's a paltry dividend, but it still, still serves. And that dividend is, the div, is what the boys calls the wages of whiteness. That is, that they believe that one day they will become a CEO or a slaveholder if they work hard enough, that the, the material benefits are not just something that may happen, but supposed to happen because it's their privilege, it's their entitlement. Um, and then they see every day the institutional power and the violence of, of racism and racial violence against black, brown, and indigenous peoples. That's not to say, like, I don't want to be them. No. Um, and, I, I, and, and that idea of differentiation is then reinforced by the state. Um, but there are other elements to this, you know, uh, as well. The, the most dangerous one for me is indifference because, you know, yes, we can find all kinds of examples of white racism, but the indifference among white liberals to me is, is way more dangerous because what ends up happening, I say more dangerous, but equally dangerous because they end up actually accepting the fact that racism is racism. It's really tragic. I'm not one of them. But, you know, it's unfortunately anti-blackness will always keep black people down and I just wish it was different and they walk away um, and they stand in the sidelines rather than insist that institutional racism is something that you have to fight and destroy in order to win the class war. And it's not something that you can eliminate through a workshop, through trainings, it's something that you have to fight for. And that is to say, anti-racism, ending patriarchy, anti -tran ending transphobia, homophobia, these are all part of a class war to bring about the kind of vision that was embedded in Jubilee in the first place. When you say, I mean, my, my perspective on, 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 on the, the white liberal is that they are more inclined to at least a, a identify or attempt or uh, to as as anti-racist than they are in seeing the this as a inherent problem with capitalism yes that that is true I, I don't disagree with that um, uh, you know but we have this other problem um, I think you know which extends both to liberals and to some white radicals as well. And that is accepting the idea that um, 
anti-black racism, racism is, is a permanent condition that can't be changed. And that, or worse, uh, worse than that, the idea that the only way to change it is by ending capitalism. Um, and, and that would be a great, great idea if it were true, you know, <laughs> because just like racism and gender inequalities and gender uh, oppressions predated capitalism, it'll post-date it as well, unless it's addressed. Right. You know, I mean, so, let's talk about uh, that, because that, I mean, that is the, I mean, t- to me, you know, within the sort of center to the left, that has been the, there are basically, uh, you know, there there are two broad positions that I've, I've you know, uh, come across. One is that uh, we need to fight racism without any regard for capitalism and how capitalism reproduces racism and perpetuates it and needs it. And then there, on the other end of the spectrum, there is, um, we don't need to think about, or, 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 or we don't, there's nothing that we can do to address racism without getting rid of capitalism first. Um, but 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 if I understand your argument, is these are things that need to happen simultaneously. Simultaneously, all the time, you know, and you know the the this idea of of privileging race over class, a class over race, to me never made sense because you know when you're in the middle of a fight, uh, you fight the modes of oppression that you're dealing with. And for a lot of black people, indigenous people are fighting for land um, and brown people, uh, they're dealing with racism. In other words, the class expression, the, the way that class oppression is affecting them is through racism. You know, that's why Stuart Hall had this line about, you know, racism is, is, is uh, the modality through which, you know, class, ex, you know, exists or, you know, how it operates. And so, you know, many ways, um, to me, it's not a debate. Th- there are ways, though, in which um, fighting racism could reinforce capitalism if you're not careful. Like, for example, the idea that, that what we need are just, you know, more black cops, more black elected officials whose position might be completely reactionary. Right. Um, you know, or that somehow black capitalism is a thing that's going to save us all. Of course, no one, anyone who's on the left, they don't believe that. And most, most black progressive or radicals don't believe that either. That's not the debate for me. Um, but to say, for example, that the struggle in Ferguson around Mike Brown's murder wasn't about, wasn't anti-capitalist, is to misunderstand what actually happened. I mean, you have people in the streets who are fighting a system in which the police extract wealth, right, and pay for itself through ticketing and fines, you know, and this is the the thing that led to Mike Brown's murder in the first place. So they're out there fighting a system of rapacious capitalism expressed through the violence and and fascism of of police practice. And then people are saying, well, this is not about anti-capitalism. These are the same people out there fighting for 15 dollars an hour for as a minimum wage, same people. So there's a way in which if we, if we don't understand how the system's functioning, we're going to make the mistake of thinking that class struggle is the colorblind thing. You know? And anti-racism is the anti-class thing. And that's not actually how it functions. And this concept of racial capitalism will allow us to see better how these things function you know, co-constitutively, right. Robin D.G. Kelly, professor of American history at UCLA. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Really appreciate it. And um, happy Juneteenth. And uh, uh, Yes, thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Yes, appreciate it. All right, take care. Bye-bye.